Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. So in this video, what I want to do is introduce the notion of a projective variety. Now these projective varieties are the basic object of study in projective geometry, and they are the projective analogues of affine varieties that you study in affine algebraic geometry. Now, how did we define affine varieties? We did that by looking at solutions of polynomial equations, and that's what we want to do here again. But since we're in the projective setting where you use homogeneous coordinates, what we'll need to consider are things called homogeneous polynomials. And that's what I want to talk to you about first. Okay, so as usual, you fix a field denoted with this f, and usually we assume that this is algebraically closed, but for what I'll say right here, that's not a big problem to assume it to be fairly arbitrary. So firstly, let's consider a polynomial in the variables x0 up to xn. And what does it mean for it to be homogeneous? Okay, so if it's homogeneous, it has a certain degree. So suppose it's degree d. It's homogeneous of degree d if it's a linear combination of monomials of degree d. Okay, so I think it's best to give a little example to make that clear. So consider this polynomial in x0, x1, and x2. It's just x0 times x1 minus x2 squared. Okay, so it's a linear combination of the monomials x0, x1, which has total degree 2 in the variables, and this x2 squared, which is total degree 2. If we were to tack on a linear term like x1, like just add x1 to this, then it's no longer homogeneous. It's degree 2 as a polynomial, but it's not homogeneous. Okay, so you need each of these monomial terms to be of degree 2. Okay, so remember, if we look at homogeneous coordinates, we can scale these coordinates and it represents the same point in the projective plane. So let's look at the value of p when instead of evaluating an x0, x1, x2, a lambda x0, lambda x1, and lambda x2. So what you need to do is uh, where you see x0, you put in lambda x0. Where you put in x1, you put in lambda x1. And here, you have to square this term here, so that's uh, minus lambda squared x2 squared. So let's simplify this expression here. There's a lambda squared that you can factor out from here, and a lambda squared from here as well. And then what remains is x0, x1 minus x2 squared. And this here is just the original polynomial. So this is a rather interesting fact, that if you evaluate this polynomial, not at the usual variables, but lambda times the usual variables, the whole polynomial gets scaled by lambda squared. So there are some things that we should note about this specific example. Okay, So firstly, you may think, well, this is a function. It's a function of x0, x1, x2. But it's not a function of the corresponding point in the projective plane. Because when you change to this homogeneous coordinates, which represents the same point, you change the value of this function. So this is a rather curious fact. Okay? So that's a warning. Okay? This homogeneous polynomial is not a function of P2. But this property that you see here is a fairly general property of homogeneous polynomials. So let's record that in this fact. And it's quite easy to see why it's true from the calculation I did in that example, which generalizes easily. So if you're given a polynomial, P, which is homogeneous of degree D, and instead of evaluating at x0 to xn, you evaluate it at lambda x0 up to lambda xn, then what you get is some scalar multiple of the original, and that scalar multiple of the original is just lambda to the D times that original. Okay, so in the previous example, the 
polynomial was homogeneous of degree 2. So you had a lambda square pull out of that. And you can see quite easily that if all your terms were homogeneous of degree d, of course, you can always pull out a lambda to the d from each of those terms. And that's why this fact is true. And this tells us something else, which is going to be very important when we define projective varieties. So remember, when we look at homogeneous coordinates, we can scale the coordinates by any non-zero scalar. So let's suppose we're given some non-zero scalar lambda. And let's, instead of looking at the function, all the possible values, let's just ask when is it zero? Well, the point is, when is this zero? Okay. Well, this is zero when precisely this is zero. And of course, you've put out this lambda to the d and lambda is not zero, so this term is not zero. So this is zero precisely when the original polynomial is zero. So even though the actual values of this polynomial depend on the choice of the scalar multiple of this, the fact of whether it's zero or not does not depend on that, as long as this scalar is non-zero. Okay, so that's the basics about homogeneous polynomials, and that allows us at least to give the definition of a projective variety. Okay, so in the case of affine varieties, we look at a set of uh, polynomials, and here for projective varieties, we look at a set of homogeneous polynomials, say P1 up to PR, in these n plus 1 variables x0 up to xn. They're homogeneous, and their degrees can be quite different. They don't have to have all the same degree. So this could have degree 2, and then 3, and whatever. And then, then essentially, we can repeat the definition that we use for affine varieties to define a projective variety. So what's that? So essentially, the, these polynomials define a projective variety, we denote by V, P1 up to PR. And it's basically the set of solutions to these equations. You set all the polynomials equal to zero. So they're the set of points inside the projective n space consisting of those homogeneous coordinates, such that if you put in pi of all those homogeneous coordinates, you get zero. And of course, the key point is how the fact gets used is it doesn't matter which choice of homogeneous coordinates you use to check this equation. Right? If it holds for one of them, it holds for all of them. If it hold, doesn't hold for one of them, it doesn't hold for any of them. So this is the definition of a projective variety. And that's the basic object of study in projective geometry. OK, so let's have a look at the projective variety V, P1 to PR of the points in the projective space where these polynomials are 0, and ask, what does that look like? Well, the easiest way to see what that looks like is to look on each of the open patches. So let's pick one, since they're all fairly symmetrical. And uh, say, for example, the open patch where the x0 coordinate is non-zero. What does it look like there? Well, all you have to do is just look at this subset of those homogeneous coordinates, which are essentially the ones given by the coordinates where the x0 is 1, since you can always scale it to be that if x0 is non-zero, and ask when are all these equal to 0 for those coordinates. So you're asking to look in x1 up to xn space, this affine n space, when are these polynomials 0? And that's precisely the condition. And that means that this is an affine variety. So on each open affine patch, this projective variety is just an affine variety that's easily gotten from the original just by substituting one for the appropriate coordinate in each of these polynomials. Okay, so what are the simplest types of projective varieties that are somewhat interesting? They're the lines and conics inside P2. So let's have a little look at that first. Okay, so suppose you're given a homogeneous polynomial, P of x, y, z. So they're your homogeneous coordinates inside P2. I hope you can guess what the definition of a line is. The line occurs when this 
polynomial p is linear. So degree of p is equal to 1. So what about the case of a conic? So that should correspond to the case where the degree of p is equal to 2. But we'll omit the case of degenerate conics where this p is factorizable, so you can write it as a product of two linear homogeneous polynomials. In that case, the set of zeros of those is, of course, just the union of two lines. So that's the degenerate conic, and we won't include that in our definition of a conic. So we'll also assume here that p is irreducible. Okay, so there, the definition of a line and a conic. And of course, it's easy to get a picture of what they look like. That's because on any affine plane, which is an affine patch of this P2, this projective line here looks like an affine line, or maybe it was the line at infinity, so it's going to be empty. And similarly here, basically on any affine patch, this is going to be an affine conic. So if you're familiar with the conics and lines, in affine geometry, then this is only something which is a lot related to that and easy to see. Okay, so let's have a look at another example about what we can do with lines and conics. Let's have a look at an example where we consider one line, say the line where this uh, projective variety V of Z, so that's just the Z equals zero line. And also we'll look at the conic that's given by this homogeneous degree two polynomial 2x squared plus 3xy plus y squared plus z squared. And let's look at, at trying to intersect a line and this conic. So hopefully the picture you have in mind is the following. Conic may look something like that. And you have a line like this. And so you expect two points of intersection like that. Let's do this algebraically. To solve this algebraically, you have to solve simultaneously. So what you can do is you can set zero, z equals zero and this equation equal to zero. And when you do that, well, you might as well set this term here equal to zero. And what you get is a homogeneous polynomial equation in just x, y of degree two. Let's write that down. So essentially, this is given by solving 0 equals 2x squared plus 3xy plus y squared. That's the equation that you end up solving. And this gives you something inside P1 with coordinates x and y. Since now you've made z equals 0, so you're looking at this z equals 0, which is a certain line at infinity inside the projective plane. So how do you solve for this? So you want to find all homogeneous coordinates, x, y, which are solutions to that. So you're essentially interested in the ratio between y and x. So the easiest way to do that is just to divide this equation by x squared and see what you get. So I guess the first point to make is that y equals 0 is not a solution to this. If y equals 0, then these terms go, then x has to equal 0. And you can't have both x and y equal to 0 as homogeneous coordinates. So y is not 0, so we can actually divide by y squared. And let's look, or x squared for that matter. Um, let's divide by uh, y squared. So you get 2x on y all squared here. Here you'll get x, y on y squared, so that's 3x on y. And finally you get a plus 1. So the key point here is that you get a quadratic equation in x on y. So that means when you try to solve this, there'll be two solutions, as you expect.
So another way to think about this calculation here is that what do I do when I divide by y squared and I look at x on y? I'm essentially looking at a certain affine patch of this, an affine line inside here, that part of the projective line where y is not zero. And on that affine patch, you can easily calculate these two solutions. So those two points of intersection are actually in that affine line inside the projected line. Okay, well, as you can see, in this calculation, it didn't really matter too much what homogeneous degree one polynomial I had here and what homogeneous degree two polynomial I had here. When I do this calculation, at the end of the day, I'll get some polynomial, if I go down to this step here, essentially a polynomial which is degree two in a single variable, and so there are always two solutions. So the argument can be shown more generally to show the following nice fact. That any line and conic inside the projective plane will always intersect in two points, at least when you count it with multiplicity. And that's because you're solving a quadratic equation. You have to include multiplicity because, of course, the roots could be repeated. So this is a proof now of something that I showed, or mentioned at least, in my video on Bezu's theorem, that any line intersects a conic in two points with multiplicity. Now, this fact that any line and conic in the projective plane intersect in two points has a very, very curious corollary. And that is the fact that the projective conic in P2 is isomorphic to the projective line. And what I want to do is to show you why that is true. Okay, so suppose C is our conic in P2. So here's our projective plane, and here's a conic, so C. And we're going to assume that we have a point on here, like that, P0. So in the case where the field is algebraically closed, you will always have points on your conic. But in general, I guess there will be some homogeneous degree 2 polynomials where you can't find zeros of that inside the projective plane. But this argument will work whenever you find a point on the conic. Okay. So what are we going to do? I want to give you an isomorphism from this conic C to the projective line. And the way I'll do that is I'm going to go through an intermediate step. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the set of all lines inside the projective plane which go through this P0 here. Now, remember, what is the projective line? That's just the set of all lines inside the affine plane, which go through a fixed point. And the point is that, well, that's actually the same as this object here, because it doesn't matter whether you look at the lines inside the projective plane or the affine plane if they go through P0 turn out to be the same as it turns out. You don't have to worry about that line at infinity. It's not going to change anything. So these two are actually the same. So what I want to do is to give you a bijective map from this conic to this set here. And how do I do that? Well, let's suppose I'm given a point inside here. Where do I map it to? I have to, have to map it to a line th through P0. So here's my point P, say. And the line I'll pick is just the one that joins P and P0. So that's the line P, P0. And that gives me a map from here to here, except you might ask, well, what happens if I pick the point P to be equal to P0? Which line do I pick then? Well, then this definition doesn't make sense, but there's an obvious choice for what line you should pick. And the way you do that is you think, well, this should be, so to speak, a continuous type of map. That's how you should think of it, at least. So you can take the limit as this P goes to P0. And what happens to this secant line? It just goes to the tangent line here. So if you put in P0 here, it gets mapped to this tangent line here. 
And so that gives you a nice map from this conic to this set, which is naturally isomorphic to the projective line. And the only thing now you have to check is that, well, it's a bijective map. And that's actually clear. And why is that? Well, let's suppose we want to try to construct the inverse map. What's the inverse map? Okay, so you pick a line like this one here through P0. Of course, you want to give back this point here. And how do you say, well, this is the point that it came from. This is the unique point that it came from. Well, what you do is you intersect this line with this conic. And what do we know? We know that it has to intersect the conic in two points, including multiplicity. Now, it's a line through P0. That's what we start with here. So P0 is one of the points. And so the inverse map is given by considering the other point. OK, so that works for all the lines which look like this. And the only thing that's a little bit funny is the tangent line. So if you're putting the tangent line here, of course, what's the intersection of the tangent line with this conic? Well, that intersection is it's this point P0, but with multiplicity 2. And so you can still think of P0 as being the other point, because there are two copies of P0 in that intersection. So this tangent line gives you the point corresponding here is going to be P0 by the same um, map. And that gives you your inverse bijection. And that completes the explanation of why the projective conic is isomorphic to the projective line. Now, this very interesting fact shows you one of the reasons why projective geometry is a lot nicer than affine geometry. Because when you look at affine geometry, it's not always the case that the affine line is isomorphic to the affine conic. They're fairly close to each other, but actually the easiest way to see how they are close to each other is to make them subsets of the corresponding projective line uh, and the projective conic. When you see it in that way, you'll see that, well, the corresponding projective conic is actually isomorphic to the projective line. And then to see how far apart the affine notions are, you just have to see what the line at infinity removes. So for a conic, the line at infinity will intersect this in two points, including multiplicity. So it may remove two points. But if it's a tangent line, it may only remove one point. So what does the line at infinity remove from the a projective line? It always removes just one point. So this gives you a very nice way to understand the relationship between affine lines and affine conics. And as usual, when you look in projective geometry, the statements of all the theorems are much nicer than in the affine case. But they do allow you to draw conclusions about what happens in the affine case. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.